Hello again, everyone. Hope you're having a fantastic week. Here we have chapter three for the professional server book, table setting, napkin presentations, and table service. Um, I know it says napkin presentations. We're going to focus more on table setting and table service methods in this lecture. Napkins are kind of handled in class, as that's a little more, um, it's a better way to handle that for you to actually see it in person and be able to practice it rather than just showing you slides. If you want to look at different napkin presentations, I encourage you to either look at the book or go ahead and Google different ways to fold napkins. Uh, it's just more practical to do that in person. Anyway, let's go ahead and dive in here. Uh, so methods of table service. We're going to be talking about the American way, uh, also called individual plate service, butler, English, Russian, French, counter, banquet, and in-room dining. So the first one up, American service or individual plate service, also known as team service. So please note that all of the forms of service we're going to talk about following this use a team. Yes, banquets, you're working as a team. Butler service, you're working with a team of others. But were you to be quizzed on this, hint, hint, wink, wink, um, and generally when people talk about team service, it is this method that they are referring to. So, most popular form of service today, not only in the United States, but all over the world. Servers are generally responsible for a section. Uh, the average is about four to six tables. Fewer if it's a fine dining atmosphere, because in that situation, there's generally more table maintenance going on as you are serving multiple courses, and the guests just have higher expectations, and there's more demands, and there's you know more trips to the table, more things you have to worry about. So the more often you're table side with the guest, the fewer opportunities you have to take more tables because there's just more responsibility there. Whereas if you were working in a breakfast restaurant or a or not necessarily a different restaurant, a breakfast service or a lunch service, you know generally maybe it's a roll of silverware and then you're dropping just one plate and then the check and then the guest leaves and that's a little bit more simple so you can handle more tables. So it really does depend on what style of service you're performing and what time of day. But again, the average is four to six. So if we look over to the right hand side of the screen here. Uh, this is a very real four-person map, section map, for the Class Act restaurant. So uh, what I can show you here, we color code ours. So here's one person's section, I mean, if you can't already figure this out. So that's one section, here's another section, here's another section. Um, these here are window tables. So this is prime real estate, so this is a good section, and this is a five top here, so that's of uh, the big table in this section. Back here we have three booth tables. Okay, prime real estate. Again in the green section, three booths right here, prime real estate. Guests generally tend to ask for booths. And then this room here, this is our large party room. So this is generally set for 12 to 16 tops or either we can go as low as eight as well. Um, so the goal here is to have each section balance and we've done that by giving this person here the largest party, so they're going to be making money and an automatic service fee on that. And then each one of these, this person has the three nicest booths and two window seats, more prime real estate. This person has a large table, window seats, and this person has booths and another large party table back here. So really well balanced. That's what we're talking about uh, when we talk about server sections. Okay, and this changes. You know, we have maps for two people and three people all the way up to five because that's really about the most that we would ever uh, have on is about five servers. So when we're talking about the team, components of a fine dining service team over here, front server, back server, server assistant, and sommelier. Not sommelier, sommelier. It's French. Uh -huh. uh, so front server. And again, this is working in an environment where each one of these team members uh, is hired on for the specific role. Front server. This is the person that's going to spend the most time with the guest. They're the order takers. They are the face of the menu. They explain the menu items. Um, so again, they take the order. They send it back. They probably help run out food, but if not, they're the ones that are coming back and checking to make sure everything tastes okay. Back server. This is someone that is maybe um, filling the non-alcoholic beverage order, helping get ready to run the food. When that's ready, maybe they're breading and watering the table for the front server, those kinds of things. Server assistant, generally also in the same category as a bus person. These are the people that are going to be clearing and resetting the tables. Maybe sometimes they'll water or bring bread to the table. Again, it just kind of depends on how many people you have on your service team. That's a very broad role. Uh, if you ever look 
online at places that are hiring server assistants, the job description varies quite a lot because they are really the, the kind of catch-all for responsibilities in the restaurant. And then the last one here, uh, sommelier, I should put a slash here and also say maybe just the floor manager. Um, but the sommelier specifically is a certification and they are the wine steward of the restaurant. So they would go out to the tables and try to assess what the guests are enjoying for food and then match a bottle of wine or bottles of wine to go with that. It's a very specific job. Um, it alleviates the pressure for the front and back servers to know the wine menu in detail as well as all the ins and outs and nuances of pairing that. Um, so that is, when we talk about the fine dining service team, those are the main four components, which is why this is called American Team Service or Team Service. Here in the Class Act, our servers are really all of these, okay, especially the first three. Um, our supervisors or floor managers can sometimes step in as a sommelier, though none of us have the certification right now. Again, none of us have taken the Court of Sommelier exam, but we do know the wine list better than anyone else. So sometimes the sommelier is only selling wine. Sometimes they're out there selling wine, um, but they also act as the floor manager. So if service recovery needs to occur, they're the ones that are stepping in. They're maybe doing two bite checks on tables, that kind of thing. Okay. So next up, butler service. You'll see this in Banquet World. Uh, this is for light refreshments, hors d'oeuvres, served on trays, pretty much the things you see in the two pictures here. Also referred to as flying platter service. Um, uh, occasionally referred to as a white glove service as well. Sometimes rather than being uh, barehanded, they will have the white gloves on. Uh, with the silver trays and that's just a more elegant look so their job is to peruse the floor check on guests you know offer hors d'oeuvres offer a glass of wine a glass of bubbly um, and you know it's for a reception type environment where there's no formal meal or before the formal meal is served english service also known as head of household um, so the practical application here at home would be think of you know your favorite holiday with your friends or family and generally there is a protein of some sort or maybe a very large vegetable if you're a vegetarian or vegan um, you know the main dish is what we're talking about the main dish that you know mom or grandma is really proud of and then you know dad or grandpa or the head of the household whoever it is it wants to carve it and they make a big ordeal this is what we're talking about. So generally the sides are already pre-placed on the table and then the host of the meal is going to carve the protein and serve it to the guests. So the professional application of this is usually family style sides on the table and then the server will present a platter of the proteins. Maybe it's already pre-sliced, maybe it's not and they will serve the guests going around the table, ladies first, oldest to youngest, then gentlemen, oldest to youngest, uh, and make sure every guest has the main protein or whatever the main item is of that meal. Generally done in a multi-course setting. So that's English service, also known as head of household. It kind of makes sense. So think of those holidays, you know, where one person's serving, that's what you're doing, but as a server. Russian service, very similar to English service, but it's referred to as silver service, okay? It requires staff members to serve from ornate bowls and platters, as you see in the picture behind us. Um, you know, not typical like ceramic or stone service ware. This stuff has to be polished. Uh, it's either pewter or silver. You know, lots of cleaning and preparation goes involved with this. It's very elegant. Uh, it's expensive, which is why you don't often see it anymore out and about in the world because there's a lot of, it's a big overhead cost for restaurants to buy all these uh, dishes, not only just to buy them, but then to buy like the chemicals and the cleaners and invest in the time for the servers or the server assistants to set their polishing after they've been cleaned. Uh, the amount of labor that goes into maintaining this stuff is just not usually worth the investment from the business. Uh, again, usually multi-course setting. This can either be uh, one server dedicated to your table or maybe like one or two tables again look at how ornate this is and how many different things are on the table so that requires a lot of table maintenance uh, it could also in a private dining setting mean you maybe have three or four people for a group of uh, you know six to ten or twelve and they're just in the room all the time and one person has the water and they're watering the tables and one person has wine and anytime someone's you know wine falls low that person handles that and then the other two are handling the food and it's just a big organized circus of beauty and ornate 
platters flying in and out of the room as the courses are served. So a lot of overhead from the utensil standpoint and the dishes as well as it costs a lot of money to staff the people to handle that because sometimes it's more than one person per table. French service. Used in very formal settings, often requires a gear don or service cart that is a link. I have also put this link in the uh, the subfolder there on Talon. It should be next to this video. Please go and watch it. Uh, it's a great flambe video of a gentleman making a, I believe it's a crepe Suzette. Um, so French service, essentially to boil this down, it's cooking table side. So servers must possess culinary knowledge or skill. It's more expensive for guests because you are asking for someone that does have that knowledge or skill to be uh, you know, they're cooking for you, so that's a higher hourly wage. They're probably not a tipped employee. The food items are going to be uh, more expensive for the guests as well. This can be a multi-course experience from, you know, start to finish of the meal. Most commonly, though, it is seen as, like, a, seen as a single item, um, you know, a single item show. So either for dessert, again, the crepe Suzette, but it doesn't always have to involve heat. So you could also think about, like, table side guacamole at your local Mexican restaurant, I've seen that, or tableside Caesar salads. Those are also examples of things that can be done in the style of French service uh, that don't require an open flame. So really it's any time that a service staff member or a chef is making something for you tableside. This is, you know, very popular on the dining room floor once the first table of the night orders something that is table side a lot of the guests you know that haven't ordered yet are like oh what's going on let's check that out uh, and then they want it so it sells well because it's a show right next to the table and guests like that so just be aware you know yes it requires some extra skill uh, you have to be careful of course with open flame if you are using that but it is an aspect of service that really does sell itself once guests on the floor start to see what's going on because then they want to be a part of it and you know the table over wants to be a part of it so good money maker for the restaurant if done well okay so is there a style of service dedicated to table side showmanship the answer is yes the hibachi grills that everyone knows and loves you know you go out and they do the little um, you know flaming volcano or choo choo train or whatever it is um, here we have a picture of a bunch of happy people you know the chefs are right there in front of you cooking your entire meal for everyone so I mean that is a very in-depth version I mean it's hibachi so it's its own style but some people could say that's in the style of French service as well okay counter service a little bit more laid back and casual it's designed for quick ticket times generally found in diners coffee shops soda fountains fast food it's inexpensive and informal in general very few items are preset on the tables, right? Maybe just some silverware and some napkins. Condiments are usually off to the side. Uh, this re reduces front of house labor costs. So over to the right here, we actually have a picture of our very own Big Grove Brewery down in Iowa City. Uh, and if you have been there, you know it is a counter service establishment. So you have to go to the bar for your drinks. And then you have to go to this little window here that says order and pick up. And there's a big uh, menu on the wall. <clears throat> and that is a, the counter service for food. So you go, you order, you get a little buzzer, you sit down, the food's up, you get you know buzz buzz, and then you go get your food and your condiments and you basically serve yourselves. And then what they do have is they have bus people coming out after you leave so you don't have to clear your own tables. But other counter service restaurants may ask you to clear your tables as well. So what Big Grove has done is they have this huge expansive place that the customers are essentially running and all they have to do is hire bus people to go and pick up after the consumer, wipe off the tables, just make sure the you know silverware is set and they're good to go. You know that's a table flip. They don't have to worry about linens or you know making sure things are overly clean or tipping out servers or anything like that. It's all done at the counter. Banquet service, used for large groups of people. Uh, definitely use of limited menus uh, so it can be served quickly, right? No one's ordering off of a menu in a banquet environment. It's predetermined ahead of time, which means it's either a buffet or people go through a line and they serve themselves or plated, meaning that the host, uh, whether it be the bride and groom or just the host of the corporate dinner or whatever it is, has chosen a set menu and maybe they you know eat the email out and they say okay tell me if you want beef or chicken and then we know okay we need 200 beef plates and 100 chicken plates 
uh, you know, they have a red or green card, depending on what it is, and then we serve that, that's plated, okay? So plated is served. It involves a larger team of banquet servers because the people aren't serving themselves and they remain seated the entire time. Buffets require fewer service members to be present. They just need to make sure that people are watered and have their iced tea, and, you know, there's probably a bar in a separate area of the, the room or the event space. Um, and then you have a couple people looking over the buffet to make sure that the food doesn't run out, but less uh, intense as far as staffing goes. So you'll learn all about this in your banquet modules. I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but this is a photo of our ballroom here at the Hotel at Kirkwood Center for a, I believe it was a wedding, very elegant. Okay, the last two, room service. Uh, seen in hotels and resorts, right, can either be for certain hours a day or for larger establishments, 24 hours, especially if you go to like Vegas or whatnot, you know, that room service is always churning. And for the larger hotels, I mean, we're only a 71 room hotel. So for larger hotels that have, you know, hundreds of rooms or even thousands of rooms, the IRD or in-room dining department usually has its own kitchens, its own set menus, and its own service team. So rather than being a server that's also responsible for running things up to the room every now and then, you are hired on as a room service server or a room service cook. And you have your own little spot in the hotel, uh, and it's just so busy that that's the demand for it. So you'll get to learn a little bit about that both in, um, well, in the restaurant and, of course, in training week. Dessert carts, this is just the last kind of little thing of service as well. Maybe you've seen it um, out in the real world. I hope you have. It's kind of fun. It's a selling technique by restaurants to sell more desserts. And so what they do is they push around a little trolley that already has the desserts on it. And sometimes the desserts are a lacquered version of what's on the menu. So you can't actually just take what you want off the cart, but it's there in front of your face. And sometimes it is actually the real desserts that are on the menu. Um, and so if you say, ooh, I want that, they say, here you go, and they take it off the cart and they hand it to you, the guest. Proven to increase sales, of course, because it's harder to say no to a piece of, you know, chocolate cake or sorbet or whatever it is uh, when it's right under your nose versus if you're just looking off of a paper menu um, and you're like, you know, I can probably pass. I don't really need that dessert. So they do this as a sales technique to really, you know, increase those check averages and to make sure that people are getting, um, you know, a little sweet tooth, getting their sweet tooth fix at the end of the night. So if we haven't seen it, uh, I encourage you to go somewhere that has it. It is a lot of fun, especially when you can just pick what you want right off the cart and enjoy it right then and there. Okay, so flatware guidelines. Uh, we have a little infographic here off to the right. Um, I did not design this, and it has a lot of things on here that are good, but also some utensils that are not necessarily always going to be preset. I think they're just giving an example of uh, everything that could possibly be set on the table. And again, this is very similar to what we do in the class act and banquets, but it is not exactly what we do, so please take this with a grain of salt. Okay, so in general, silverware is placed on the table so guests can enjoy from the outside in, meaning that your first course item is here, okay, usually your salad fork, and then you get rid of it and you move on to the next fork, and then you move on to your dinner entree, and then you're done, okay, and then by dessert, usually the dessert stuff is either up here, uh, or the server will bring it out to you when you're ready for it. Same thing over here. Maybe there's, you know, here's a soup spoon, okay, right here, number 11, I believe. Uh, yep. So if you had a soup, you'd enjoy that first. Then your teaspoon, you have your different knives here, fish knife if you had a fish course, and then your dinner knife if you, uh, you know, have a steak or something else. These, are, these two items are not usually preset. The soup spoon and this salad knife, um, that is not usually on the table, okay? But they're, again, they're just kind of showing everything that's possible. So forks are placed to the left, always, if you didn't know that. Uh, knives and spoons are always going to be to the right. When placing steak or dinner knives, the blade should always face the plate. Okay, so they did a great job in this picture. You can see the blade, which is right here, is facing in towards the plate, and that's so that if you have your hands on the table, um, on, on either side of the setting, like up here or up here, and you were to you know swipe over, you wouldn't be hitting the edge of the blade and potentially injuring yourself. So at least that's the method that the reason that, that I've heard. Um, it's also just a sign of elegance and it kind of keeps it all really concise on the table. So blades are always going to go in. 
All right, dessert silverware. So we already kind of talked about that. It's up here. It's going to go above the setting, fork on the bottom, spoon on the top. The handle of these utensils is going to face their respective families. So the handle of the fork faces the fork. The handle of the spoon faces the spoons. Okay. Uh, let's see here, 15, dessert knife. I've never seen that before, but I guess if you had one, that would go all the way at the very tippy top. So our setting in the restaurant, uh, in both restaurant and banquets, the napkin here that they have, number one, would actually be in the middle uh, on top of the plate, and we usually only preset two forks. So we, we have these two that are always preset in the restaurant, so a salad fork here, dinner fork here, and then we set a uh, dinner knife, which would be eight, and a teaspoon, number 10 right here. Uh, so those are, we have, so it's a four utensil set. So two forks, the salad, the dinner, dinner knife, teaspoon. Um, these other things can be set if you know you're going to have those courses, but we don't generally preset those and we do not preset um, the dessert silverware in the restaurant unless we're doing a special event like a prefix menu where we know that the guests are going to be ordering dessert or we know they're going to be having fish or something like that or we know they're going to have soup then we'll preset it but if we don't know we're just going with that basic set of two forks knife and spoon okay so here sorry for the grainy picture but uh, what we're trying to look at here is these spots, okay, oh, bad circle. These are water spots from the dish machine, okay? These are common, that's gonna happen on all your silverware when it comes out of dish. Uh, this is why we polish both glass and silverware is to get these marks off. So what should you do if you notice set silverware, so silverware that's been set on the floor continues to have spots on it? Okay, there's always a lot of debate about this. Yes, obviously it needs to be fixed before service, but in general, if you're seeing this, if you're coming in for a few shifts in a row and you keep noticing, you know, when you're pre-shift uh, check over the floor, that there are water spots on all the silverware in your section, you need to alert a manager because it means that someone else on your team is not doing their job and not polishing the silverware. And they're just ignoring the fact that it's dirty and it's being set on the floor. That's not fair to you, it's not fair to the other service staff. Uh, and it's certainly not fair to the guest if it gets missed because then they think that you're running a dirty restaurant. So just be aware of that. Make sure everyone's pulling their weight. Okay. Bread and butter service methods. All right. So we serve bread and butter at dinner in the restaurant. And then we also serve pastries for brunch on Saturdays and Sundays but we'll focus on methods for bread and butter at dinner right now. So you could do roll and butter placed on a B&B, &B, which is a bread and butter plate prior to arrival. And let me, we're gonna back up, oops. Okay, here is the B&B &B plate up here. This is what we're talking about. And ours usually goes right down here to the left of the forks, but you have a, a butter knife and then the plate, this is called a B&B, &B, bread and butter. Okay, so you could either have the roll placed on that prior to the guests arriving. Okay, so the guests haven't even sat down yet, it's preset. You could put them in a basket and butter on the table for guests to serve themselves, often served warm. This is what we do, okay, at the class act. So we have bread in the warmer, and we have butter that's, you know, put in ramekins ahead of time. It's a house herb butter. And we take that out to the table when the guests arrive, so it doesn't get cold. Rolls and butter served to each guest by the server, done so so rolls can be served very hot. So this would be, you know, the guests have already sat, maybe you have a drink order already, maybe they've put their order into the kitchen already, and then you come out with piping hot rolls and butter on a platter or out of a basket, and you, with tongs, serve the guests individually. So a little bit more involved uh, than this first one. I should say the second one. The last one here, I call it the Outback Method. Uh, small loaf on a cutting board accompanied by butter on the side. Guests can cut and serve themselves. This is a very fun method. It gets the guests involved. Uh, so from that aspect, guests do enjoy it. If you're serving a small loaf anyway, the benefit of this is that it keeps the bread from drying out. Um, whereas if you're pre-slicing bread and you know giving that to a guest, it can get dry in the hot box. Um, the biggest downside here is you are giving the guest usually a sharper knife than normal, usually something serrated. And then if you see over here in this picture, 
Um, all these little crumbs occur from cutting the bread and that gets all over the table. So it's a very, very messy method of table service. Or I'm sorry, of bread and butter server, bread and butter service. Blah. So you have to take that in consideration as well, uh, depending on what kind of restaurant environment you're in. You know, are you going to be crumbing the tables very often, um, or is it the type of place where it just doesn't really matter because the lights are dark enough and you're going to sweep at the end of the night anyway? So something to consider. I think the rolls in the basket with butter is the most common way of doing it, and again, that is the way that we do it here. Okay. Coffee and hot tea service. Again, will be covered in training week, if not already. So, we're going to place the coffee cup and saucer to the right of the teaspoon with the cup handle at 4 o'clock. This can also be done at 3 o'clock. It doesn't have to be 4. I've seen it a couple of different ways. Our infographic, a couple uh, screens back, I believe, had it at the 6 o'clock position. So, again, just refer to your establishment's house policy and consider that to be correct. It's nothing you need to bicker over with your management. Um, <clears throat> if cream or sugar is ordered, you need to place that above the coffee cup and saucer, so more towards the center of the table. Coffee should be the last item to be placed on the table. So if someone orders coffee, cream, and sugar, you would set down usually the sugar caddy first, um, most towards the middle of the table or by the centerpiece. Then the creamer would go um, kind of in between the water glass and that sugar caddy, and then the coffee cup is the one that goes, and, and saucer. Uh, goes directly to the right side of the teaspoon on the place setting closest to the guest. You want to make sure that the coffee is the last thing on the table. Well, I should rephrase this. You want to make sure that the guest has everything they need to enjoy the coffee first before setting the coffee on the table. So if they ordered cream and sugar, you would never come by with a cup of coffee, set that on the table, and then say, okay, I'll be right back with the cream and sugar. Because now the coffee is just sitting there getting cold, and they can't even enjoy it with the cream and sugar that they asked for. Okay, so I'll side tangent off of that and talk about supplementary silverware. So if a guest has, you know, a cup of soup um, or they ordered a steak and so they need a steak knife, you would bring out the supplementary silverware before that course is served. So, you know, at dinner they get a choice of uh, soup or salad to start. We don't know if they're going to get super salad, so we do not preset a soup spoon. But if they order soup, we know that we need to go and drop the soup spoon before the cup of soup hits the table. If they order a steak, again, we have a very large menu, so we don't know if the guest is going to get a steak, so it's not preset, but they order a steak. Okay, well, they, you cleared their first course, and you know that the steak is coming up soon. You need to go drop a steak knife. So that way, when the steak hits or the soup hits, they have the proper utensils to enjoy it. That should make sense. That's very common sense okay but it's a thing it's a step that a lot of restaurants miss uh, you've probably experienced it yourself and it's just laziness on the service team's behalf okay tangent done uh, so the proper creamer to guest ratio is one set of cream and sugar for every four to six guests same for pulp, salt and pepper shakers okay again these are general rules these are guidelines so you know you gotta think about it if four to six guests all order coffee and they all want cream Every single one of them wants cream. You're probably going to end up putting more than one creamer down on the table, okay? This four to six thing is like maybe, you know, five of them order coffee and two of them want cream. Okay, well then you just put one creamer down. So you really have to kind of use common sense with this and make sure that the guests have enough product. Now that said, maybe you have a solo diner or a one top that orders coffee, cream, and sugar. You wouldn't necessarily fill the creamer all the way full when delivering it to the table because they're probably not going to go through that much cream and you don't want to waste product. So maybe you would put the creamer half full, something like that. So use common sense. Don't waste product. You can always get more, but make sure that the guest has what they need to enjoy what they've ordered. Okay, that is it for chapter three. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed that. We'll do chapter four in a separate video. Um, again, the chapters three and four will be combined into one 10 question quiz, so you don't need to worry about a quiz over just this chapter. It will be over two. Thanks so much and have a great day.